The centenary of the Big Four has led to much reminiscing amongst rail fans. Oh sure, there's been plenty of YouTube videos and press coverage on the subject, and some of the biggest enthusiast gala weekends have gathered guest locos from each of the companies. Credit where it's due to those who've tried, putting on a big event is tough at the best of times. But to be honest, there's been so much attention on other matters, like railways launching emergency appeals, that celebrations like these haven't always had the coverage they needed. Come to think of it, with so much stuff being turned out in BR black or green, it almost feels like the 15 guinea special gets more noticeable anniversaries. Don't panic, I've talked for long enough about liveries in preservation, so I'll try not to waffle on about it too much here. There's just more to renovating a railway than just slapping paint everywhere. Replicating the 1950s and 60s is a popular pastime in terms of modelling, motoring or music, but in the last few years, tastes amongst younger generations have wandered beyond living memory namely towards the grouping and pre-grouping eras of railway history. Now, sure enough, with modern signalling and safety practices at heritage lines these days, you can never fully recreate the past. But it's worth making clear that some railways, through no fault of their own, don't always have much choice but to rely on whatever they can lay their hands on, normally an industrial tank engine and some XBR coaching stock. Either due to costs overwhelming footfall, or availability or suitability of stock, or the manpower to run and maintain it properly or store it properly, there's always those who don't have the support that the Seven Valley or Great Central does. Examples of these, like the little Whitwell and Reefham in Norfolk, are still in the beginning stages of what they set out to achieve. But at least the Whitwell and Reefham still retains its original period buildings, with the aim being to maintain a feel of the 1930s and 40s. The beauty about infrastructure like this is that you can, in theory, replicate a number of eras with some of them. Many wayside stations at numerous railways date back to Victorian times, with only minor aesthetic updates provided throughout their lifetime. In some cases, such as the Swanage Railway, you'd only need to repaint a few signs here and remove the totems there, and there's a big chunk of railway backdated from the BR days to a much earlier period. In some cases, there isn't a single formula for an entire line. On the Bluebell Railway, stations have been renovated to showcase key periods in railway history. Sheffield Park shows the line as built in the 1880s by the London Brighton and South Coast Railway, albeit with modern facilities. Horsted represents the southern era between the wars. Kingscote represents the sulky service days of the 1950s, albeit much cleaner, and East Grinstead is... Not what the artist impressions had in mind way back in the 90s, but what there is has been turned out in roughly the same style as other stations along the line. Think of it as the wardrobe door that leads to Narnia. Speaking of the Bluebell, 2023 has shown some unbelievable news in terms of locos and stock. One of the three standard four tanks has now ventured onto pastures new, with the owners relocating it to the West Somerset, and serious talks have been made public about overhauling the sole surviving Adams Radial tank of 1885 vintage. This engine has been out of service since 1990, so there's already a whole generation who haven't seen her running. Her renovation is due to take place behind B4 tank Normandy of 1896 vintage, and both of these will only happen after the completion of the new Brighton Atlantic Beachy Head, itself a 1911 design. Now okay, the engine is currently due to enter service wearing BR black, but that's not to say she can't be changed into an earlier livery later on. And it's not all about the engines. Over the last few years, two of the Bluebell's Mark I coaches have been disposed of, Three if you count the old carriage shop at Horsted, replacement pending. With plans to renovate more of the railway's Maudsell coaching stock, it's another step in the direction of showcasing how rail travel used to be around 100 years ago, instead of 60. From an interest point of view, it's already been established that some passengers tend to prefer riding in older coaching stock instead of their modern equivalents. And of course, during the pandemic, the compartment nature of old coaches meant that some railways could remain open and enforce social distancing. While it's also been established that plane bearings take more frequent maintenance than roller bearings, the weight and seating benefits can offset some of these shortcomings. A Mark I usually weighs around 33 tonnes and can seat around 54 people, while a Maltzel Open 3rd from 1935 weighs around the same and seats the same but looks nicer, and a Southeastern and Chatham equivalent from the early 1920s weighs the same but seats up to 100 people. From a financial point of view, it already sort of makes sense to use smaller engines, which are usually from an earlier period in history. On the Seven Valley Railway, a pannier tank from 1930 can be lit up and run for a whole day of seven-coach service trains on about three tonnes of coal, 
Meanwhile, a bullied Pacific from 1946 and rebuilt in 1957 would need the same amount of coal just to be fired up from coal. And with the Seven Valley's Great Western coaching stock, the chance to match a grouping engine with a grouping set is another draw for curious minds. What's more, during experiments with various forms of bio-coal and eco-coal, smaller locos tended to burn it more efficiently than bigger ones. On the Bluebell, engines like the O1 or Fenchurch tended to burn it more effortlessly than something like Camelot. So, older locos in stock plus older architecture equals profit and sustainability, right? Well, not necessarily. And even if it did, what is the cost? There's no getting around the obvious fact that a smaller engine will be less powerful than a big one, so with a limit of shorter trains, the railway in question won't be able to carry as many passengers at once. Keep in mind that during pre-Covid days, the Bluebell needed 100 passengers a day to cover a four-train service. Not to mention, a Southeastern and Chatham goods engine from the turn of the century will always have to work harder to pull five coaches than a standard tank, meaning it could wear out more quickly. So there's a balancing act when it comes to expense, maximising footfall while minimising fuel and, more crucially, wear and tear. Grouping and pre-grouping designs not only tend to require more maintenance than BR machinery, but they're generally older and, with some exceptions, more worn out. There is a theory going round, not one of mine I should point out, that many engines which have been through three working stints in preservation are becoming life expired. And while they could go through a fourth working stint and maybe more beyond that, it would require possibly the most comprehensive overhaul of its life. Take Grandad's favourite punchline for instance. Since withdrawal in 1963, Flying Scotsman has been overhauled five times. Seven if you really want to count her 24-day retrofitting in 1963 and her BR-era retube in 1993. Her 2016 overhaul involved significant boiler work and replacement of frame sections. Now, public support and rich benefactors allowed sufficient funding to be raised to undertake the work, but mainly because she was Flying Scotsman, the single most famous steam locomotive in the world. Whereas Princess Elizabeth, which has been through three working stints in preservation, started on a fourth in 2016 but stalled twice pending extensive further work, may struggle to find the same level of global support. And if you ask the same number of people to rally together to restore Normandy or the Adams Radial, interest will be there, but some may wonder what's so special about them compared to Scotsman. Indeed, most rail fans would rather see Green Arrow run again than Scotsman, and Green Arrow has also had at least three working stints in preservation the last of which ended on reduced boiler pressure and a cylinder block that the NRM would rather conserve rather than repair. Say what you will about that, but their engine, their choice. I suppose one of the flip sides to representing older eras is just how many people would genuinely care enough to seek them out and support them. When the Swanage Railway debuted LSWRT3 number 563, hopes were high that it would really bring in the masses. I mean, who could resist seeing something that hadn't pulled a train since 1945? The engine ran for nine days back to back in October 2023, and visitors did indeed travel far to see her, but some trains were running low on takings and other trains didn't even run at all. Now there were complications with Swanage's ticketing system that were called out early on and revised later that week, but even with the best will in the world, the T3 didn't exactly attract the same number of people that Flying Scotsman or the Big Boy does. Which begs the question, even with the best advertising and social media coverage, if something is operating from outside living memory, who will care about it if they can't remember it? Nostalgia is based around properties that people either grew up with or were taught about by their ancestors. And these days, chances are there are more people who remember seeing or learning about the Ivan Mickey Mouse tanks on the Lyme Regis branch in service than they remember seeing the Adams radials they replaced in 1961. And when it comes to era one of railway history, there's only really a minority who are trying, admirably, to make it accessible to the masses and get them to care about it without misrepresenting it. Again, the frustration being, the publisher of said minority claims that Era 1 just doesn't sell enough to make it worthwhile. So a bygone era from living memory does matter to people, but on the other hand, eras from outside living memory are always interesting to explore. Appropriate representation of history is important if society is going to contextualise its past and learn from its mistakes. An expansion of one's mind is never really a bad thing, especially if it happens outside the classroom. They say curiosity killed the cat, but variety is the spice of its life, and, dare I say it, a better understanding of its past could lead to it living longer and potentially happier. 
A big-named engine from the 40s might be easier to advertise and able to haul more passengers, but the running costs are much higher, you can't paint them in different colours without people kicking up a fuss and threatening to cancel their membership, and if everything is just painted either in BR black or green, it risks everything becoming a bit... well... dull. At the end of the day, everyone's going to have different tastes as to which period in history they'd like to revisit and replicate. Some will obviously prefer BR because it's what they've remembered, and that's fine. But for better or worse, tastes are slowly shifting from outside the 50s and 60s to earlier, more colourful, and more interesting times. Railway history didn't start in 1948, and a chance to bring life to how things were before then can be so refreshing and enlightening. Just so long as we don't bring the attitudes and practices that went with it. But this is just one take. For the sake of sharing ideas and interests, what era of railway history do you enjoy learning about? Are there any heritage railways that you think managed to capture the feel of a specific era that isn't the BR days? Are you part of a preservation society that's at loggerheads over which era to recreate? Or do you simply have time on your hands? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below. Or in the pub. And seeing as it's Christmas, I'll have a 1698 this time. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue. I lost my mind in lockdown Time and time again I lost my mind